start over. Good morning, everybody. Uh, just uh, to reiterate, my name is Jeremy Hollingsworth. I'm a team lead at Jacobs and uh, senior project manager. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, this session. We've got some great speakers coming up today. So um, first off, I uh, just wanted to introduce Amanda McKinnish. Oh, sorry, forgot housekeeping. Um, uh, just please everybody silence your phones if you haven't already. And uh, as uh, Geneva mentioned, she's got uh, forms in the back. And I do want to say thank you to Geneva. She's a recent uh, Washington State grad, uh, Jacob's intern, and she's going to be starting at UW in the fall as a graduate student. So thanks for her help. So, And it's my pleasure to welcome Amanda McKinnis. Uh, she's a senior project manager and strategy lead at Jacob's. Uh, she's managed wastewater and stormwater plans and projects around the Northwest for more than 25 years. And she's got a bachelor's degree from the University of Wisconsin and a master's degree from the University of Washington. So please welcome her. Thank you, Jeremy. The title of my talk today is Developing an, Developing an Alternative Approach to point source based regulation of nutrients on Puget Sound. And I wanna take a few minutes um, to acknowledge my co-authors, David Austin um, is with Jacobs in our Minneapolis office and Ryan Dunn um, is here in Seattle um, and both helped put this together. No. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit just about the background of the nutrient permit. Some of you will be real familiar with that, others won't. Um, I'll talk about the challenge before us, um, with Puget Sound water quality. Then I'm going to talk about two kind of different um, thought paradigms around regulation and nutrients. One is integrated planning um, and direct oxygenation. So I've put up this graphic here, which is kind of the underlying um, a science that we've all become familiar with, with nutrients um, really across the United States, that an excess of nutrients can throw off an ecosystem in terms of generating excess algal growth. Algal growth. The algae decomposes and can create um, depleted oxygen levels. The other processes increase carbon dioxide and acidification and that can place um, environmental stress on uh, the ecosystem as a whole. So that's really the background for um, the whole process. Okay, there's all kinds of pressures over the last decades in Puget Sound. We've all lived and worked there. Um, lots of growth and development that manifests in increasing wastewater flows, runoff from our streets, our housing developments. Um, also climate change has really changed um, the temperatures in Puget Sound. And um, what we see in the climate models is extended longer periods in that low DO hypoxic. Those periods are getting longer um, and longer um, with climate change. But some of the water quality issues we see on Puget Sound are really classic um, fjord sound water quality issues. And some of them are geometry based. So I've just shown a profile here of a shallow embayment on the sound um, with a higher DO water at the surface and then DO loss and low um, DO and hypoxic conditions in the deeper waters. And some of the um, low DO in those shallow areas is that these sills prevent circulation of the deeper oxygen rich tidal exchange waters with those um, deeper areas in the embayments. So some of that um, is, is geometry. So the state of Washington has a unique dissolved oxygen standard. So we have a marine anthropogenic depression allowance of 0 0.2 milligrams per liter. Um, some states have a set value for a dissolved oxygen standard. Um, and in fact, ecology gives us some guidelines here of um, in terms of gross DO, what's considered four milligrams per liter is considered fair, five good, six excellent, and seven extraordinary. 
Um, but that's not the way the standard's written. The standard is written in terms of an anthropogenic, which is people-generated um, uh, DO depression of 0 0.2 milligrams per liter. So I've clipped out um, the map of the areas with the number of days of DO depression from the latest bounding scenario report from ecology. And it shows a progression. The units there on the side are the number of days of meeting that dissolved oxygen standard, the 0 0.2 milligram per liter standard. And you can see some um, increase in the number of days of DO standard, especially along Hood Canal um, during that eight year period. So there's been a couple studies that have looked at what fraction of that um, is due to this natural geometry of those shallow areas and what fraction of that is anthropogenic in nature. And there's a couple studies out there that say something between 80 and 85% of that observed DO depression is due to the natural um, geometry in those areas. And the remainder um, is uh, anthropogenic in nature. So ecology, I should not have the draft on there, it's no longer draft. Um, at the beginning of this year, put out the Puget Sound Nutrient General Permit um, to address those areas, um, the shallow sills and the oxygen depression area. And that focus of that permit is on the 59 um, point source treatment facilities that discharge to Puget Sound. So I've shown um, them all on the, on the map there. Um, and the focus of that permit is multiple fold. The first is optimization. Um, all those facilities are required to do near-term optimization to stay under their current loading. Um, so loads don't continue to increase with growth. And then the facilities are required to essentially do facilities planning, nutrient reduction evaluation um, to get to eight milligrams per liter or ACART, all known and reasonable technologies, and three milligrams per liter total inorganic nitrogen for the moderate and dominant dischargers. So the near-term focus of that permit is um, on point source control. So there's challenges um, with that uh, approach. It's extremely expensive. The numbers are in excess of $20 billion um, sound wide to implement the nutrient improvements. King County's numbers are between nine and $14 billion for King County to comply. Um, has a very large carbon footprint, um, takes a lot of oxygen. Um, and power to remove nitrogen from our point source treatment facilities. And when you look at going to three milligrams per liter, um, you're also looking at large chemical consumption um, that has a significant carbon footprint. So there's not a, not a downside um, to driving those treatment plants to lower levels of, of treatment to address the dissolved oxygen depression problem. And the models, um, there's a Salish Sea model that stretches essentially from Canada to the reaches of South Sound. Um, says even with all of that improvement that does not fully resolve um, the dissolved oxygen problem. There are areas in the sound that, are, that have um, <clears throat> DO depression that aren't influenced um, in the model by point source dischargers. So point source control alone would not fully resolve this problem. So I pulled out a few headlines here from the Times. Um, this is a complicated issue with many views. Um, and uh, it, 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 in my view, uh, needs a complicated solution. I just wanted to say a couple words about the hearing. Um, so the, the permit came out at the beginning of this year, there was a group of seven dischargers that appealed that discharge permit to the Pollution Control Hearings Board. Um, and earlier this year, um, they issued a stay on certain components of that permit only to those utilities that, that um, participated in the appeal. So more to come on 
that process. I just didn't want to be silent on the fact that there's a legal process going forward here. My understanding is that there will be another, the next hearing is sometime in December. And if there's others in the room that know more about that than I do, but that's what I've heard. So that process will continue to go forward. Okay, so the focus of what I really want to talk about today is, are there other ways, um, in addition to the current point source approach or other ways um, as this process evolves, in my mind, it will certainly evolve, um, maybe through the legal system and maybe just through an evolving regulatory framework um, with a couple different paradigms. Um, and one is integrated planning, um, which I'll talk about on a sound wide basis and maybe what role individual integrated plans could play. Um, and then I'm also gonna talk about direct oxygenation, um, the areas that we're concerned about are these shallow areas in Puget Sound. Um, it's a much smaller um, footprint um, than the Puget Sound as a whole, and perhaps um, direct oxygenation to those areas um, may make sense. So integrated planning. Um, we've had an integrated planning framework really since 2012, the form framework was put forward. Um, and we've had several utilities across the state use it. It maintains the existing regulatory standards, those aren't changed, but it allows utilities to provide, prioritize their investments based on the most pressing environmental protection issues. So it's a really a more flexible um, tool than more traditional facilities planning. It's purely voluntary um, and encourages the use of innovative technology like green infrastructure. So I do think um, it would be challenging to do this on a sound wide basis. We have lots of different utilities. Um, um, but I do think there is uh, a coalition of dischargers here, the Puget Sound Clean Water Alliance, um, and now some work um, with the Association of Washington Cities where we see those cities come together um, and work together. So I do think it's possible. Um, I do think we might need more granular models to make um, good bay-based decisions. Um, the Salish Sea model, like I say, stretches from Vancouver all the way down to Olympia. And I think we would wanna answer questions that were perhaps more um, local to Bud Inlet, Commencement Bay, Admiralty Bay, Quartermaster Harbor, and that we might need um, a better, more granular modeling tool um, to make those decisions. And it might require an amendment to the State of Washington Clean Water Act to really fund something like that. Um, we think back to the original Clean Water Act in 1972, and I really think about this nitrogen program is really um, as big uh, a movement in wastewater treatment in this area as it was back in 1972. And a lot of those projects took 10, 20 years, some of those projects weren't built into the 90s. Um, so it took a big investment in infrastructure and it took time. Um, so I think if you looked at integrated planning rather than having really a technology-based effluent approach, which is what the current permit has, um, you would have to ask prioritization questions. Um, where would you spend your first $100 million on Puget Sound, $200 million, if you could look at it in aggregate and change the paradigm? Um, I think it could, you could end up with different answers to the questions. For example, I think you could have a smaller discharger um, in a sensitive area and have that improvement be more, more important um, than a large discharger in a large area, but the current framework doesn't allow um, for that type of decision-making. It's just not set up that way. And I just put kind of the elements here of an integrated plan, thinking more on a discharger by discharger basis. Um, these elements have been around a long time. And again, it just provides more a more flexible tool that um, could get to the kinds of answers um, we may need on Puget Sound. And like I say, um, looking at the triple bottom line, things like habitat enhancement and restoration, 
um, looking at that carbon footprint and weighing those types of costs or possible projects against a point source investment. I think having a different framework that lends itself to that type of analysis could make a lot of a, a lot of sense and really just allows a wider view of advantages and disadvantages of approaches. Okay, we have a couple of good examples here in integrated planning. One's right here in Spokane. This integrated plan is now 10 years old, almost 10 years old. It came, it was in 2014. Um, it was used very effectively here. It include point source and non-point source um, components. It had broad-based goals for protection of the Spokane River and the groundwater. Um, and like I say, it took years to implement. I don't, you can't really see it there on the graphic, but the point source implementation took a long time. Um, and some of the non-point source things um, could be done a little more quickly. Those were values-based decisions um, that were broadly made within the integrated planning framework. And SPU did this more recently with the goal of um, CSO reduction. So it was a different goal, but again, I think the framework has merit. Um, you know, ranked stormwater and the CSO projects based on water quality impacts, um, proximity to existing projects, risk, O&M, and community values. Um, so I think that framework lent itself um, to making the kinds of decisions that I'm talking about. Okay, so the other sort of non-traditional paradigm is this idea that we would oxygenate these sills directly. And I like this idea for a couple of different reasons. The, but the thing I like most about it is it doesn't fit in any box. Um, the, what do you do with just adding oxygenation to solve a DO problem that doesn't fit in a traditional facilities plan? The, the thing I can most liken it to, to what we've seen is like planting trees in a riparian area to address a temperature TMDL, right? It's like doing something out in the watershed to address the issue rather than doing something remote from the issue and waiting for the ecosystem to respond and do what the models say it will do. So I've shown a few photos here. Um, the idea here is just like I say, add oxygen um, with a diffuser at the base of some of these shallow areas. Um, we maintain the stratification. Um, we don't want to disturb the pycnocline between the um, colder water below and the warmer water up above. Um, what I've shown here is this is a freshwater reservoir where they're in a boat and they're pulling. This is the diffuser line um, that they're pulling across the lake. And then way in the trees, you can see the liquid oxygen tower there in the trees um, in the distance. Why do we use oxygen instead of air? Um, because we want to we want to keep the pycnocline in place. Um, we're not trying to mix the water column. Um, air bubbles expand as they come up through the water column and disturb that pycnocline. So what we're trying to do here is keeping that warmer, fresher water up above, keep the pycnocline in place, um, and keep the colder, saltier air wa water below, but oxygenated so it's not anoxic as it is right now. Pretty simple to construct. Um, those pipe, the pipe is welded on site. They deliver a pipe in sticks. I'll show you another picture. It's welded on site and the construction of the diffuser itself is pretty straightforward. There's ballast um, at, at intervals to hold the pipes um, on the bottom of the reservoirs. Um, and they're put in position and sunk in place. So it's done all over the country in freshwater reservoirs. There's more than 40 installations in the United States where oxygenation, direct oxygenation is done. It has not been done in a marine setting um, at any scale before. So it's being contemplated in the Baltic Sea um, and there's a pilot project <clears throat> that's going forward on the Chesapeake. 
So this is innovative, um, an innovative application of a more traditional um, technology. So just to give you an idea on scale, the largest freshwater reservoir in the United States that use oxygenation um, uses about 350 tons per day of oxygen. And the total um, DO demand in the Baltic Sea uh, finger areas is 10,000 tons per day. And if we were going to address the oxygen depletion in all of the depression areas in Puget Sound would be about 2,000 tons per day. So not out of the realm of possibility, but not has not been done yet either. So this is just a profile of the pilot installation for um, the Chesapeake. So the A there on the left is the liquid oxygen tank showed in a vertical installation. B is the vaporizers that take that liquid oxygen, turn it into gas um, to be uh, injected through the diffusers at the base. Um, in the Chesapeake, we're looking at relatively shallow installations. Um, the Picno Klein is about five meters deep. Again, there's these little concrete um, ballast anchors to keep the diffuser in place. Um, the diffuser is set um, between 14 and 25 meters um, deep on the Chesapeake Pilot. So, and like I say, I think this could be an interim solution. I, su I suspect the point source improvements, well, I know the point source improvements are gonna take a while to fund plan, design, and implement. So I think oxygenation could be done more quickly. Um, here's some photos of some freshwater reservoir installations. Um, they're pretty small. We take about a quarter acre of land, roughly. Um, I've shown a vertical installation, a horizontal tank. The one at the right is screened because it's close to a development. Um, these sites are pretty simple. Um, it's an access road and a concrete pad. They're not manned. Um, they have remote, um, remote sensing where you can check um, the oxygen level, but they're not manned. They're you know, usually checked on once a month. Um, so they're pretty straightforward from a civil engineering standpoint. There's also a potential um, benefit here with green energy. So there's been a lot of talk about hydrogen fuel um, and electrolysis, um, especially at our ports, where um, if you generate hydrogen for fuel, a byproduct of that process is oxygen. Um, and so it's possible you could pair um, an oxygenation project with a green energy hydrogen fuel project. And there's a couple places on the sound where something like that might make sense. It would take a unique coalition of people who don't normally work together to pull something like that off. Those are two completely different um, silos in our infrastructure system, but the opportunity um, is there. Okay, so there are some pros and there's some significant cons to this oxygenation idea. This low latency or that it could come up quickly. Um, I think we could speed up this um, resolution of some of these dissolved oxygen depression issues by decades with installing a few of these systems. Um, it could restore oxygen to areas that aren't impacted by municipal point source treatment plants. There are some areas that the models say will not be addressed with the best point source treatment we have um, wouldn't be addressed and potentially oxygenation could be used to improve um, the DO depression in those areas. And while I really crave a dollar per oxygen demand number, like I really would love to say it costs a hundred dollars to to get a one pound improvement in DO depression and $10 to do it with oxygenation. The math just isn't, isn't that straightforward to, to do that. But I can say um, it is an order of magnitude lower um, cost uh, than the 
treatment plan alternatives, which like I said, it's more than $20 billion to upgrade these Puget Sound treatment plants and has a reduced carbon footprint. We're spending much less energy compared to these treatment plant improvements, especially when we're looking at three milligrams per liter TIN um, to consider oxygenation. And I'm just showing a photo there. That's just the oxygen lines disappearing off into a reservoir, just showing what that looks like. So a pilot project in Puget Sound could follow um, the consumer, similar conceptual development as what's going on in Chesapeake and Baltic Sea. Like I say, this is innovative. This would be an innovative application of the technology. Um, I do think there's, uh, could be, um, again, in the right framework, um, a good business case for this, where you could have a credit trading system um, pricing, uh, where a utility buys a pound of DO credit um, somewhere else in the sound. Um, but it is not a complete solution. Um, you could not solve the Puget Sound dissolved oxygen depression issues. Um, just in this way, you certainly need components of point and non-point improvements are still required. And the biggest area <laughs> uh, downside is it really, like I say, it's a non-traditional mindset to think in this way. This is not how we as utilities or regulated regulators think about solving problems. This is a non-traditional solution um, to the problem and, and an incomplete one. So we've given this presentation on oxygenation many times, um, and we've get, we get a, many of the same questions back. So I'll address a few of them here, and then I'll open it up to questions from the group. Um, this one came from King County's um, staff after talking to King County. They asked about how do you control the rate of oxygen? to the water body if you don't have staff, if you set this up in a remote environment and walk away. Um, and the flow, flux rate of oxygen is controlled by mass flow meters um, and designed just like we would an aeration system in a you know, aeration tank with design and numbers of diffusers and the maximum amount of oxygen, oxygen that could be delivered to those diffusers. The oxygen delivery component of this, there's a lot of confidence um, based on the freshwater application about our ability to control and understand um, how much oxygen we're providing even in remote systems. So if you deliver at a X depth um, with Y bubble plume, we know pretty well um, what that's, how that system is operating. Um, and I've just shown a photo here um, it's from a, a freshwater reservoir, but this is in the um, NOAA application on the Chesapeake, just showing when the, when the DO system comes online, you can see the DO values go from kind of the lower DO in the oranges and reds to the higher DO in the blues and purples. And it's just doing what it was designed to do to raise the DO in that bottom stratified area. But the process is well understood um, the oxygenation process. <clears throat> and this was the second biggest concern from King County. What about the unintended consequences of adding too much oxygen? Um, because we don't understand it very well, especially in a marine environment. Um, so you could design a system to present to prevent super saturation. Um, and we have the Salish Sea model, like I say, where you could model, we've talked to a Puget Sound Institute about their ability to model um, oxygenation, and they say they can do that. Um, we could model what the different scenarios and how much um, demand is needed and how much oxygen we would supply. And in startup, um, what we do is start low and dial up slowly. Um, so we can have a remote DO monitoring. Um, we do that all the time. Um, so I, I guess we think the risk of adding too much oxygen is relatively low. Um, so again, here in the picture, I'm just showing these are the pipes getting ready to be welded in the field um, before they're taken out and dropped into a freshwater reservoir. Okay, so this is the tough question. How do you site it and how do you permit it? So siting, you do need power. 
Um, so you're limited to areas where you have power or are willing to extend power to a remote oxygenation system. Um, and right now on the Chesapeake, um, we're working with NOAA and others to understand what type of permitting needs to be done. Do you need an EIS to do this um, or even enabling legislation to do to alter um, the physical conditions in a public water body? It's, it's not an insignificant um, challenge, the permitting aspect of this. So um, in closing, I just wanted to pre <clears throat> present some other paradigms other than point source control um, for ways to address this DO depression issue. Um, and while point source control is certainly a logical component of the solution, it may not be the most effective or measurable solution, um, either integrated planning or oxygenation may have a role to play as the regulatory program evolves. And I really do think we're gonna need broader, more innovative approaches to solve what's a very um, complex problem on Puget Sound. So with that, I'll take questions from folks. Is this working? Okay, good. So I'll come around for anybody who's online, please go ahead and, and chat a question. I'll come back and check that after I've had a chance to walk around and hand the mic to people in the room. So does anybody have a question that they'd like to ask? Go ahead, Jim. Andrew, I don't think you can translate it online. Amanda, who would, um, what are your thoughts on who would fund and own the oxygenation projects? Yeah, so the question is from James Che and who would fund and own the oxygenation projects? So we have gotten the most interest from um, private investors um, and environmental groups in this, people who um, have more flexibility um, to implement this. I think it's really hard for bigger organizations to make a decision to do something like this. Um, so I think in the short term for a pilot project, um, my guess is it's going to be a coalition of innovative entities that choose to take this on. And I don't know what that combination is going to be. It's a good question, though. Could you speak a little bit more towards uh, what an integrated plan would look like on the Puget Sound? Yeah. Yeah, like I said, I think it's challenging the idea that you would get 59 entities to work together and work in our individual organizations, much less under a broader umbrella. I don't think that's an easy sell, um, but I do think like I say, we have the Puget Sound Clean Water Alliance. We do see the utilities beginning to work together um, through the Association of Washington Cities. Now we're doing some facilities, the point source facilities planning together. So I do think we see the beginnings of a framework of these utilities working and thinking together. And I think, especially when you talk about the magnitude of these costs and the carbon footprint of these costs, and you look at them in aggregate, I think there's real power in that. Um, and so I guess I think it's possible. Um, if you look at BACWA as a more mature group of dischargers who have a you know mature structure of their organization. And I think you could look into the future and say, it is possible um, that something like that could be done. There could be a stronger central framework where the dischargers work together and ask these questions um, as a group. Uh, what are our priorities and where do you spend the first dollar? Um, I think the, this technology-based effluent approach now it really just applies a blanket, right, to all of the dischargers. So I think there's a real incentive and an opportunity for leadership, frankly, in the discharger group, and maybe even from the state of Washington um, to lead a paradigm shift on how these kinds of decisions are made. 
So I think it's a bit of a pipe dream right now, but I do, I do think it's possible and there are seeds of it um, germinating today. So. Go ahead. Have to be one large overreaching integrated plan, or could there be smaller integrated plans clustered within down the infrastructure? So the question is, could there would there have to be one large integrated plan, or could you have smaller integrated plans? Um, I I think you could have both. Um, I, I I wish the regulatory framework lent itself in a little stronger way to the individual decision making, um, but I think you could do, I think you could do both. And then you you have the the gorilla in King County, right? And then and then all the other dischargers. So I do think it's possible um, to achieve the water quality better, value based water quality decisions with both. That's probably the more likely scenario is that people will go off and do, if there was a regulatory framework that allowed them to do that, to go off and make the integrated decisions on their own. And then maybe like we're doing with AWC, then aggregate those um, together through an organization like that um, to see what the group impact is. Right. <clears throat> We probably have time for one more question pending anything online anybody in the room let me run back here we'll work out. and i don't see any online questions so thank, thank you amanda you.